along, you can open up to Matthew chapter 6. It will also be on the screen, and of course, it's always on your phone. Just promise no video games, and uh, we're going to have a good time today. So um, as we have approached Matthew chapter 6, we began that last week. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus begins to talk about the good things that we do as people, about giving to the poor, about praying, about doing our acts of righteousness. And the point that Jesus wanted to make is that even in the midst of doing these good things, sometimes those very good things won't do anything with our relationship with God. They might even hurt it. But sometimes those things that we do can be very powerful in our lives. And he talked about two ways of living. And basically it begins with saying, Jesus, listen, if, if you're like the Pharisees and those religious hypocrites, whenever you do your good things and you do them for other people to see, you don't get a reward. Well, actually, you do get a reward. Your reward is that the people you did, or excuse me, your reward is that the good things you did for people to see, your reward is that they saw them. Mission accomplished. And that's all you get out of it. But Jesus invites us not to do our good things for other people to see, but to do our good things for an audience of one. And he says that when we do things just for him with proper motive in our heart, there's a reward from God. And he rewards us with his presence, with his peace. There are eternal rewards and all these things. He doesn't tell us what they are, but we know that what he has is anything better that you could get from anyone else on this earth. So that's how Matthew 6 opens up. And today we move specifically into the topic of prayer, kind of along the same type of thinking. So here we go. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And uh, could, we, could we move the PowerPoint? I don't have a PowerPoint clicker today. Can we just move it ahead? And if you find a PowerPoint clicker, just toss it to me. All right, here we go. Matthew chapter 6, verses, uh, that's actually 5. Um, I made a wrong PowerPoint already. This is going to go. Okay. It's Matthew chapter uh, 6, verse 5. Here's what Jesus says. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. We learned about those last week, right? They're actors who they, they wear a mask. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full, right? Mission accomplished. They were seen for what they wanted to be seen for. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Thanks, Phil. And when you pray, do not keep, what does it say? Babbling. What a good word. Babbling like pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. So, Props to Justin, great introduction, right? Apparently, God is not impressed by big, long, flowery, beautiful prayers, is he? Nor does God need long prayers with all sorts of things where we just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, talk, hoping God will listen. Jesus says you don't need to do that. Now, when Jesus begins talking about babbling like pagans, when he says babbling like pagans, it brings up an image and an idea that is very concept or that is very familiar to the Jews at the time of Jesus. Because when the pagans prayed, they had a certain way of praying. And in order to get God's attention or their God's attention, they would go through all these titles and go on and on and on and on and on. And we'll give you an example. This is, this is like a common pagan prayer around the time of Jesus. This one's from Egypt. Uh, from Egypt. Um, and here's, here's the prayer. This is just the beginning of the prayer, by the way. Hail to thee, Amun Ra, Lord of the thrones of heaven, the oldest existence, ancient of heaven, support of all things, chief of the gods, Lord of truth, father of the gods, maker of men and beasts and herbs, maker, beasts and herbs, that's funny. I didn't notice that earlier. Maker of men, beasts, and herbs, maker of all things above and below, Lord of wisdom, Lord of mercy, most loving, opener of every eye, source of joy, in whose goodness the gods rejoice, thou whose names are hidden. That's a big beginning to a prayer, isn't it? Man, what's up with that? You know, 
how do you know if you pray like this? I mean, how do you know you've said enough titles? How do you know you didn't miss something? How do you know, like, what does it take to get God, what does it take to get God's attention? What does it say about the God that you believe in if you have to start your prayers like this? Now, this prayer actually reminded me about another biblical story from the book of 1 Kings. It's one of my favorite stories because it's so, it's it's almost funny, but it's so dramatic. Um, You may have heard of a guy named Elisha the prophet. Elisha, Elijah, Elijah the prophet. And, uh, And what happens is, obviously he's a prophet and the people of God. And a lot of the people of God have begun to serve and to worship a made-up God named Baal. And so this made-up God has all sorts of other prophets, too, that worship him. And they're they're teaching God's people how to worship this false God. And, you know, Elijah, is it Elijah or Elisha? I'm going to, Elijah, okay. What's that? Jah, yeah. There's Jah and Shah, Jah, mix them up. It's Elijah. Okay. So what happens is Elijah thinks, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I want to help get God's people back with the true God again. So he says, I know how we're going to settle this with a contest. So Elijah calls the prophets of Baal and he says, and he he gathers all the people of Israel to himself. And he says, on this day, I'm going to show you who the true God is. And so we're going to have a pray off. And and we're going to have a pray off. and, And then whatever God responds by fire that will be the testimony that that is indeed the true God. Elijah is a gentleman. So Elijah says to the prophets of Baal, you guys go ahead. You get to go first. So the prophets of Baal, they begin to pray. They put their sacrifice. They begin to pray that their God will answer them by fire. Elijah is watching. And what happens? Does fire come down? Do you know the story? No. Fire doesn't come down. Now, what I love about Elijah, and I got to quote this because this is like, this is straight up from the Bible. Um, this is not me. But Elijah does like some holy trash talking. And it means to trash talk these guys. And this is what he says. Perhaps your God is in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and needs to be awakened. It's funny, right? But that's kind of like, that's kind of like that other prayer, right? Like, do we have enough time? Can we get God's attention? So, obviously, their God, Baal, doesn't answer. And the people begin to get more frantic, the prophets. So, so now they start, they're not, just, they're not just praying. Now they're praying and they're dancing, right? And this, I'm not going to dance for you. Um, but they're, they're doing their dances, and then their God is still not answering. And they're freaking out. And they're thinking, oh, we really need our God to show up. So what do they say to do? They begin to cut themselves. They begin to abuse themselves, thinking, maybe we can offer our pain to this God. Then this God will answer us. They go on and on and on, and no answer from heaven. Of course, we'd expect that, because it's in our Bible, right? So the pray-off begins. It doesn't work very well for the prophets of Baal. Now, Elijah doesn't need a whole morning and a whole day to pray and to shout and to dance and to cut himself. But what Elijah does is really, really beautiful. Elijah builds an altar, and you might know that part of the story. And you might know that when Elijah builds this altar, and kind of to make a point, you know, he pours water over it. So it's kind of like, watch, watch this. My God will answer it, and he'll, he'll like catch a wet sacrifice on fire, even better. But the beautiful part of the story, if you read it carefully, what you'll see is that Elijah makes this altar from 12 stones. These 12 stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel, the descendants of a man named Jacob, who is, who is named to be Israel. And what he does, he takes each stone, he bends down, and he says, uh, he puts it down and says, your name, remember your name shall be called Israel. The next stone, remember your name shall be called Israel. And with every stone, Elijah reminds them about the relationship they have with God. And he says, remember, with every stone, remember the God I'm about to pray to. He's your father. Remember this God I'm about to pray to. He's been with you since the beginning. Remember who this God, and he just, he keeps saying, you shall be called Israel. So he builds the altar. He reminds God's people what God is like. And then when it's all ready, doused with water, 
This is, this is all he says. Here we go. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. This is a family term, right? This is the God of our fathers. This is a, a God who is close. Let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. That's it. No dances. And then (sighs) fire from heaven comes down and burns up the sacrifice. And all the people know in this moment that the Lord is their God. But it wasn't just to prove this God's better than this God. It's done to show them that this God is their father. You, the, the, you don't need to dance and to cut yourself and to give all these titles hoping that God might listen to you. That's not what God is like. Just say, Father. Now, I know when I think about this, maybe in today's world, I don't see people dancing and cutting themselves and crying out to God, perhaps just like we see in this particular story. But there is a baseline fear that so many people live with, sometimes even Christians live with. And it's the question, is, is God really out there? And if God is really out there, will he ever listen to somebody like me? Like, what, what will it take for me to get his attention? Does he really care? Now, when Jesus comes to teach now, we're going to move to this in a second, the Lord's Prayer. Um, this prayer is amazing. And I think, especially in the day this prayer was given, I would suspect it was a kind of a groundbreaking proposition about what God is like. You see, even behind this prayer, we'll get, we'll get there in just a minute. Behind this prayer, you remember the truth that we come and celebrate every morning. We come and we worship not a Savior who is dead, but a Savior who is alive. And we come to celebrate a Savior that laid down his life so that forgiveness and freedom could be purchased for every single human being. And we come when we trust in his provision, he frees us by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the power of truth and by the power of freedom. And the story is not that God has put a barrier between us and we're trying to get through the barrier. The story behind this prayer is that there was a barrier between us because of our sin and God broke through the barrier. There is, he's crushed the barrier. So we don't have to grasp and think about, is God really here? The story of the gospel is that God is for us and God is with us and God is accessible and he's not far away. He's close to all who call on his name. And that's how this prayer starts. And that's why I love this prayer. Now, the thing about the Lord's Prayer, here's the deal. Jesus gave this to us as a wonderful gift. And what's so cool about it, it's really simple. Like, I'm going to get here. We're going to talk through the prayer just for a moment to, to be reminded of some things. But you know what? Any one of you could get up here and give this part of the sermon. Because Jesus didn't make it complicated about what his prayer was about. You can all, I'm, we're going to work through it. I'm just going to tell you what I think about it. And it'll probably affirm a lot of the things that you think about it. But sometimes with a prayer like this, we can say over and over and over. And sometimes we might forget how beautiful and simple and powerful it is. But this prayer is an invitation to live in a trust with our Father. So the prayer starts with an invitation of trust. Jesus teaches us to pray. And he says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Apparently, Father is good enough to get God's attention. In fact, I bet even if you didn't say father, I think you still have God's attention. It's like a parent. As my kids cry out or they even make a noise or there's something that pricks up my ears, they have my attention. But Jesus invites us to remember that we are children and he's father. But he also has a second line, which I think is very beautiful and it's helpful too. Hallowed be your name uh, basically means holy is your name. The word holy in the Bible is a word that means separated. Or, uh, so when we say that God is holy, he's, he's nothing like we are. I, I wonder if Jesus is doing this in a way that, to remind us like, okay, all this babbling, all these names that people are trying to shout out to this God, well, guess what? God is so holy and God is so different. 
like, you don't even have to give these names. Like, even the names you give won't be enough to describe who he is. So just be content with the fact that he's holy, he's beyond anything you could possibly imagine. And you can call him daddy. And that's how this prayer starts. Next line, let's keep going through. Next line. Uh, Jesus says, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, so here's how the prayer He opens like a word of intimacy. This is your dad. And then he moves to, before we get going on to maybe some of the smaller things of life, this part of the prayer reminds us that there's a bigger picture going on in creation. It's that we're not just here by chance. We don't just, we don't just create to wake up and make breakfast and go to work and do, and then come up. God has a gigantic cosmic story written from the beginning of time that will conclude when he, well, it won't conclude. It will go on forever, but, but it's a story where God will reconcile and redeem and heal, and he's called his people to be a part of that journey here and today. And so before we get to the small things of life, Jesus begins by saying this, hey, let's remember God has written a story. Trust in the story, and let's remember first that there's a bigger thing going on. But what's so beautiful even as we think about there's something bigger going on that God is doing, God is not unconcerned with the small things and the everyday things of life. Because after he goes big, then he goes small, and he simply prays this, give us today our daily bread. My favorite word in this part of the prayer is daily. And I think it's the key word in this part of the story. He doesn't just say, hey, Pray, for, pray that God gives you bread for the next two weeks. There's nothing wrong with that. But this part of the prayer, Jesus asks us to just ask every day for the things that you need that day. Why? I think this is about relationship. I think this is Jesus saying, okay, I want you to pray for your needs, but I want you to pray every day because I'm with you every day. And I want to be with you every day. You know, it's not that we don't pray to inform God of information that he doesn't have. You know, before you open your mouth to pray, Lord, I'm not going to make my rent this month. Lord, I don't know what to do with this child who's struggling here. Lord, I don't know what to do um, with this area of my life. That's not new to God. God already knows and he already cares But God wants you to ask him because God wants to be in a relationship with you. Same thing with my kids. I like it when my kids ask me for things because it's my relationship with them that matters so much to me. And that's what's going on here today. Give us today our daily bread. And the prayer goes on. Let's keep going. And forgive us our debts. Sometimes you hear the word sins as we have forgiven our debtors. Now, I don't know about you. I'm really thankful for this part of the prayer. I'm really thankful for this part of the prayer because I have a relationship with Jesus. I love Jesus. I try to serve him with my life. I try to honor him by the way I raise my children and am a husband and live in this world. But the reality is, there's not a day that goes by when I don't, when I don't make a mistake, when I, don't, when I mess up. I, I have all sorts of problems. I get angry at things I shouldn't get angry at. I judge things I shouldn't judge. I don't always exercise discernment when I should exercise discernment. And so I believe God put this line in for people who are just like me. It's the reminder from Jesus that none of us are perfect. But it's a reminder that, you know what? That's Okay. Because as we pray daily, we can come to him. Say, Lord, I messed up. I'm not at my best. Will you forgive me? And his promise is that he will restore and he will rebuild. It's a beautiful thing about this prayer. The next part, though, and, and this is very interesting, is that he, you know, it's almost like, it almost seems like a condition on there. But I think this is really just an invitation of the prayer. And the invitation of the prayer is this. This relationship that we have with our Father in heaven and how we get to interact with him and experience his healing and his grace and his mercy. This part of the prayer is a reminder that we are created in God's image 
And our job as people of God is to simply take the relationship that I have with God and extend that relationship to other people. In the radical forgiveness he offers me, in the radical way that he listens to me, in the radical way that he's in relationship with me, I get to offer that to the people in the world around me. And you think about this, you know, what you believe about your relationship with God will deeply impact how you relate to others. You know, if, if you have a hard time accepting and, and really believing that, you, that God can truly forgive everything in here, you will have a hard time forgiving people on the outside. If you believe that God is stingy and holding out on you you'll, you, you'll be a person who's probably more stingy to other people. But if you know that God is generous towards you, you can be generous to others. If you've received his forgiveness, you can be forgiven to others, right? So this is this link that he invites us into. And then the last part of this prayer, um, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus simply reminds us, hey, right now, you live in an age that as you seek to follow me, as you seek to serve me, you need to know there's evil and there's sin and it's at work in this world. And the evil one will try to do everything that he can to get in front or to get in between your relationship with me. He will lie to you. He will try to make you anxious. He will push against all your efforts. But Jesus reminds us, have no fear. For Jesus has overcome the evil one. And so pray that God will give you strength. Pray that he will keep you out of temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. So, that's the Lord's Prayer. Now, I don't, how many of you, no, I'm not going to put this out. No raise of hands. How many of you pray this prayer regularly in your own life? Just keep it, keep it to yourself. Maybe you're a person, and I've, you know, I go in different stages. Sometimes I really struggle with prayer. Maybe finding the time or getting myself quiet or not knowing exactly what to pray for. I love this prayer. Because it's a gift from Jesus. This is a very simple prayer that I can pray when I wake up. I can pray it when I go to bed. I can pray it any time. And if you have never memorized this prayer, first of all, I might, I'd invite you to go ahead and, and maybe memorize the Lord's Prayer because I think it's really powerful. And when you don't have words, you can simply go to this place. Some people, when they pray, and sometimes I do this too, is um, you can use it as a, like a model of prayer. So sometimes if you're like, if, if you want to, like Jesus said, go into the door and close your room because prayer is about being with God and spend time with God. So sometimes maybe you're like, okay, I want to go into the room and close my door and pray to God, but I just don't know how that's going to go. I don't know what to do if I do that. Well, take this prayer and just take one line at a time. Our Father in heaven. And then what is prayer? Prayer is just talking to God. And then talk to God about how he's your father and what that means to you. Hallowed be your name. Talk to God about how he's holy. Talk to, talk to him about what that means to you. And then just take line by line and go through this prayer. Um, you don't have to. I mean, the thing about God as a father, I don't make my kids go through a formula to talk to me. They can talk to me whenever they want. And we can all do that. And you can go in a room and close your door and whatever's on your heart, you can just spill your beans. And the cool thing is, you don't have to go through all the titles. You don't have to sing and dance to get his attention. You just start talking, and he's right there listening. And this prayer, for me, as you look through it, this really is a prayer that just invites us to trust that he's Father. And everything that a father would do, it's an invitation to trust that he is, in fact, the perfect and the good Father. So what I want to do this morning, we're going to pray this together. And, uh, and, and maybe, maybe this week, you could just kind of commit to a practice. Maybe you're looking, maybe for this week, you can say, you know what? First thing when I do every morning, I'm just going to wake up and I'm going I'm to say the Lord's Prayer this week. Or maybe even memorize. Maybe you should memorize. You, actually, if you haven't memorized, you should memorize this. Because it's one of those great prayers that when you have nothing to say, this is fantastic. Um, so, so do that. And, uh, and I know that the Lord will bless you because this is the prayer that he gave us. So let's pray together and then I'm going to share a story. And then we're going to continue to worship together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There, there really is something powerful um, in the Christian journey, in the human journey, when you come to the realization that you really don't have to do all these things to get God's attention, and God truly is for you, and, um, and he really is a father to you. And so I have a story. One of the things we're doing here right now is um, something we call My Story Matters. And we are just trying to share different ways that God has worked in our life or, is, or has worked in the past or is currently working in our life. And what had happened, we were at the harvest party, and I was sitting with Glenn and Rebecca and just talking about our journeys with the Lord and stuff. And Rebecca started telling me about part of her journey with God. And one of the moments when, when she learned what it was like to recognize God as a father and what it was like to be able to trust him. And so I just said, will you write that down and send it to me? And so we're going we're gonna to just listen to her story. Rebecca's in the back, by the way. Rebecca, you can wave your hand. Um, I'm not going to make her read the story, but I'll do it for her. Here it goes. Rebecca, I was 20 years old when I got married. I was 24 when my divorce became final. During the separation, the point between marriage and divorce, my story unfolds. My nerves were very much on edge. One day I was eating dinner, a bologna sandwich. Bologna's terrible. It's your first problem. Um, I was eating my bologna sandwich over the kitchen sink. At night, I wasn't sleeping very much. I heard every sound, and every sound seemed amplified. And before it was over, I had lost 30 pounds. One night after going to bed, I realized why all this was occurring. It wasn't the fact that my marriage was being destroyed or dissolved, or my husband and I were no longer together. It was something I had done four years before. I stood in my church before God, and I took vows until death do we part. Now those very vows were broken, and I was the cause. I was the one who filed for the divorce. I was the one who couldn't live in that marriage anymore. I wanted out. I wanted to sever those vows taken before God. And now, well, I was paying for it, or so I felt. So I did the only thing I could do. The only thing I had to do. I handed it over to God. The fears, the feelings of anxiety and anguish and guilt. I told him those things were now his and no longer mine. He can handle them however he saw fit. And I was not going to accept them as simply mine anymore. A few days later, I picked green beans from the garden. And that evening, as I sat on the patio snapping them, I suddenly felt a sensation in my shoulders. It didn't last very long, maybe just a few seconds. But it was very strong and very intense. After the feeling left, I felt good, almost clean, you could say. Like when you've been working and got real dirty and then you took a shower. You feel refreshed, clean, and renewed. That's how I felt. Then I knew. God had taken my fear and my anxiety. God is near to me. And I feel grateful and blessed. You see, I told God to take my troubles. I never asked him to take them. But now I give it all to God, the man upstairs. My name is Rebecca Evans, and this is a part of my story. Let's pray. Okay, we (laughs) celebrate our Father and what he's done in Rebecca's life. Thank you, Rebecca, for sharing that with us. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are near. We thank you that we don't have to jump through a ton of hoops, make a bunch of hoopla, use all the right names to get your attention. We thank you that You don't need all these long, flowery prayers that sound really religious. Thank you that's your daddy. And we can just say, hey, dad. Hey, father. And at any point we open our mouths towards you, you already know what we're going to say. But with joy, you listen to us. Thank you for that wonderful gift, Jesus. Thank you for the freedom that can be found when we trust in you and realize that you are our father. And if you're here this morning... We would invite you, as Rebecca once did, to take everything that you carry, if you haven't done so, and to give it to Jesus and to trust him with it. And as you put your trust in Jesus, and he cleans everything up. He's amazing. 
And as you do that, would you find freedom and healing in the name of Jesus Christ? Lord, thank you for being so gracious and kind to us. And Lord, now as we also come to bring our gifts and offerings to you, we do so out of a response because of how good and kind that you are. Thank you that you are near. Lord, as we worship your name together this morning, um, God, thank you that we're face to face in your presence with you. We love you so much. And in the name of Jesus, God's people said, amen.